I, I want to mention something right now. It's kind of a strange story. I talked to the National Guard just recently. Mm -hmm. I spoke to her in Savannah, Georgia. Okay. And on the way, I have a lady that I'm working with, and we kind of came out with this, what we call, we really got to do something to try to stop this fentanyl stuff. And, and we got to get the entire population, advocates, people with the analyticals, uh, uh, just the general public, we all got to rise up, okay? And she likened it to something called the Dunkirk moment. Now, a lot of you people in the audience were younger and whatnot, and maybe Dunkirk doesn't ring a bell. But during World War II, the entire British Army was in this little town called Dunkirk. And, and they had sent their uh, army across the English Channel, and all of a sudden, these Germans were overwhelming them. And they were either going to annihilate them or the entire army was going to surrender. Well, how did they evacuate these people? Initially, they sent some big boats over. The military did. But they didn't have enough boats. Also, the Germans could take that big boat that had 10,000 people that were trying to leave, and they would sink that boat. So what happened is the entire British population got involved. And people that had small boats that could carry six people or eight people with thousands of boats went across the English Channel and they rescued that British Army. Well, you know, we need thousands of people to pull together to rescue the kids that are dying from fentanyl. We need everybody on board. Welcome to Alter Everything, a podcast about data science and analytics culture. I'm Maddie Johansson, and you just heard Dan Schneider, an activist featured in the Netflix documentary, The Pharmacist. In the documentary, viewers followed Dan on his search for justice for his son, Danny, and his subsequent mission of fighting the opioid epidemic. Dan is a data-minded pharmacist, so he was in a unique position to recognize OxyContin being overprescribed at the pharmacy and witness the alarming rise of overdoses that were happening in his community of St. Bernard Parish in New Orleans. As he witnessed the opioid crisis beginning to unfold, he documented what he observed and used data to not only bring awareness to the problem, but to drive positive change in his community and around the country. I also had a conversation with the directors of The Pharmacist, Jenner First and Julia willoughby Nason, and that conversation will be featured in our next episode. I'd recommend listening to this episode with Dan Schneider first, as it'll help you get a sense of the story told in The Pharmacist documentary before we get a behind-the-scenes take from Julia and Jenner in the next episode. So let's jump into my conversation with The Pharmacist, Dan Schneider. It's an honor to speak with you. I'm really excited. Same here. I appreciate the opportunity. Awesome. Yeah. And I can see on the video, I see your pharmacist hat. I really like that. And then you also have a pharmacist shirt on as well. I do. And I'm wearing the color purple because it, uh, August is overdose awareness. We're not in August now, but I had the shirts printed up. And I put it on today because I. it's a serious subject that we're talking about. Uh, lives are being lost every day. And while I'm at it, in the background, and people can't hear this on the audio, but there's a picture of my son over my shoulder. I think you can see it. Mm -hmm. And above that is a picture of a bunch of trees that I have called Tunnel of Hope because we're bringing light at the end of the tunnel. There is light or we will create it. That's great. And, um, you know, if you're comfortable, could you share a little bit about your son as your motivation for your mission to fight against the opioid epidemic? A absolutely. Uh, my son was kind of a peace, Nick. He didn't fight. He didn't have the tensions. Uh, he, he was interested in drugs. I thought it was basically marijuana. Okay. And we worked to try to reduce that or eliminate that. But a lot of kids do that. Okay. We were completely blindsided when, when he stepped into the world of more serious drugs. And then inadvertently, a, it's a big story, can't be told right now, but uh, he was murdered while attempting to buy drugs. And uh, I just felt like it was a snapshot of his life, it was the worst moment of his life. And, and I've had bad moments and I didn't get caught, so to speak, much less lose my life in a flash like that. So they also was treated very poorly by the police and maybe even by the public with all the stigma involved. 
And I, I just thought, you know, we can use his loss and we can present him in a different way where he can help lead us out of this crisis that we have. So he's been a big motivation not for his life not to have been lost in vain. And he, he deserved more than what actually happened to him. I, I don't think he would have continued. I think if we would have caught it and had a, a rehab or something, I think he, he would have been one of these people that emerged and we'd look back at it and said it was just one of those experiences. But he didn't get that break. We're going to tell the world about it and we're going to make something good happen. Absolutely. Yeah, I appreciate you sharing. Um, and, you know, in the pharmacist documentary, viewers can can see more of that story. Um and also, as viewers see in The Pharmacist, you're a very data-minded person. You recognize patterns in your community that signaled the beginning of the opioid crisis. You took steps to document those findings. And then you leveraged that data collection to make a difference, as you said, was you know a big piece of what you wanted to do. Um, including, you know, not only bringing awareness to the issue itself, but also influencing the launch of things like the prescription monitoring program and then your nonprofit Tunnel of Hope, as you mentioned. And Correct. Yeah. And, and this seems like, you know, such a monumental undertaking that you took on that really ramped up when you started to see that influx of Oxycontin prescriptions arriving at the pharmacy. And I just think it's interesting because you were in a really unique position to recognize those red flags because you had the training to understand things like medications and appropriate dosage. So let's say other folks out there see patterns where something is off or they start seeing red flags in their community. Just like your training as a pharmacist helped you see red flags signaling the misuse of opioids. What tips do you have for folks to start using their talents and specific training to enact change, no matter what the social issue is? Well, I hope I don't lose track because I wanted to get in something. Yeah. You mentioned you mentioned that I used data and I did video recordings and I took notes and I did things. I was not consciously using data. I was doing whatever I took. In hindsight, looking back at it, I was. And that kind of data collection and record keeping and, and, and being able to refer back, and this was before the days of computers exactly, uh, definitely helped me not only solve my son's murder, but it taught me the skills I needed later on to, to shut down the next doctor. And it also has taught me ways to interact with the public to, to, to make change. You have to have it's one thing to tell a story, and that's important, but you have to have some statistics. You have to have some data to back you up. And and this is where I believe your company is, and the people in your field, uh, you'll have an important role to play. Now, again, about tips in the community. Obviously, I was in the right place. I think God kind of put me there. You know, after, after I saw my son's murder, I wanted to go on a mission. I was mainly going to focus on the uh, educating parents and, and students. But then I had this situation that the police weren't taken care of. And I had a knowledge that almost nobody else had. And so I took it as the right place in the right time. But that leads back to the other part of this is, you know, what I have found now, and it's still the case, is you got three kind of people in the world. You got people that, that, that make things happen. And you got people that uh, watch what happened. And then you got people to say, what the hell happened? Okay. Mm -hmm. and, and so my word is, whatever field you in and you specialize in, if, if you're on the alert and you're seeking and you're trying to enrich your knowledge, okay, it's there. Many times, I hate to say it, either consciously or subconsciously, we just don't want to get involved. We don't want to stand up and maybe take a little risk or maybe uh, uh, stand out. Okay, We have to do just the opposite. One person can make a difference, usually not by himself, but that person can spark others. Okay, And so absolutely, whatever your field is in or whatever you're in, pay attention to what's going on when you see something's wrong. Okay, Don't just look the other way and say it's somebody else's responsibility. Take it upon yourself. I, I kind of learned that what I, I call hard found wisdom. And, and, I, and I, I hope others don't have to go through the same uh, 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 type of crisis or tragedy to be woken. 
Okay, my job right now is to wake the people who haven't went through that tragedy. Uh, but we all have a propensity to look the other way, not get involved, take the easy way out. You, you're never going to accomplish anything special. You're never going to be the type of person you could be to be a leader and an expert in that field. So that's my message. You know, uh, go for it. You can make a difference. That's really great advice. And something that struck me earlier that I, I wanted to mention um, as well, even even things like, you know, taking on fighting the stigma like you were mentioning earlier, subtle ways that I've heard you do it, you know, in the pharmacist and listening to other interviews that you've done. And then even just now when you were talking about uh, your son a little bit earlier and you mentioned first and foremost that he was such a sweet kid and that was just like one snapshot of his life. I think that that is all making a huge difference in itself, like just that one statement of, you know, focusing on the the person themselves rather than something that happened to them, you know, the tragedy of it. I think that that is huge in making a difference as well. I agree completely. And uh, stigma is a, a big part that we all have to overcome the stigma. It, 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 and we, we should know, and not the entire public doesn't know, is that, you know, it used to be the picture of an addict with some guy sleeping under a bridge, okay? And now we know it's affecting all socioeconomic, all races, okay? And so-called, we now know it's not a moral issue, okay? It, 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 it might be a poor choice early on, but, but these drugs are so powerful that they actually change the brain. Mm -hmm. And if it wasn't a disease to begin with, it becomes a disease or a condition that's very difficult to overcome once your brain cells change and your inhibitions are lowered. Um, my son, um, under no circumstance, would have went into that area to buy that drug, okay, if his mind was not being controlled uh, by the addiction and the draw of that drug. And so, but we got to look at these people as people who are sick. It, it's, it's, it, you know, you have compassion for a person that has diabetes, okay? Mm -hmm. You have a compassion for a person that overeats, okay? We can't stigmatize the people with we now call substance use disorder, more plainly addiction problems, okay? And so you're absolutely right. And I, I found that out, that's another thing that sort of motivated me along the way and was hard found wisdom. You know, I kind of had that stigma myself, so I, I, I'm not gonna plead that I was a perfect guy. Prior to my son's death, I, I kind of thought badly about addicts and addiction, okay? But one thing I noticed early on, I mean, I knew my kid, and I knew this was an aberration, okay? And I knew something had taken over his brain, okay? The other thing I knew, though, was he was a drug user, okay, that had an addiction, okay? When I went to the police, they tried to treat him like a criminal, almost equal to his killer. And that can't be, okay? You know, if a person commits violent crimes, okay, but the drug user now that even sometimes commits petty crimes or lies or uh, petty theft or something like that, uh, these people are not really criminals and we got to treat them not like that. We have to put more emphasis on, on, on uh, treatment rather than criminalization. There seems to be a, a big conversation about that happening now, and hopefully, you know, there's there's more and more work um, that gets done. And something else that you mentioned that I want to get clarification on, you said substance use disorder. I feel like I've always heard substance abuse or addiction. Like I've heard those kinds of things go hand in hand, but I, substance abuse or substance use disorder, um, definitely, uh, you know, that language makes it seem more like a disease, which it is. And so I think it, it definitely is framing it in a better way, I think. Well, Maddie, you're absolutely right. And, and I have a little difficulty with that. I'm a plain talking guy. <laughs> and, 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 and for so many years, we've talked about addicts and addic addiction. But, you know, the, the, uh, I have come to learn that that stains them. Using those words itself stain them. Okay. And it creeps out of me every now and then because uh, addiction is a disease. Okay. But when we can use the fact that these people have a substance use disorder, it, it does have an impact. And slowly we got to change and reduce that stigma to treat it more like a healthcare issue as, as, as opposed to a moral issue or, or a criminal issue. 
And so I'm working on that. And, and so I try to deliver that message when I can. Yeah, no, I appreciate you sharing that. I'm, I'm learning something from you right now. And hopefully our audiences as well. I think that's a really important message. But I will say this. I, I imagine you to get to this, but, you know, we are having an issue right now where the uh, if, you, if, if you did it on a, on a growth curve over the years, we've had addiction going on a steady line. They, they can't see this, but maybe it was a 45 degree angle, okay? Maybe even less than that. Maybe it was 30 degrees. And you can almost predict, it's just sad. I mean, I know we've all been working on it and we pushed it up a little bit sometime and down a little bit. We're talking about overdose deaths, okay? And, but you could almost predict, like if we got 70,000 now, you could draw a graph out, continue the line out, and you could say, well, three years from now, there are gonna be this many overdose deaths. And, and I, I, I'm not that type of scientist, but there's, when, it, when, a, when a graph goes, turns straight up, mm-hmm. I think there's a phrase for that, okay? It, it, we can't predict this anymore because all of a sudden, just a couple of years ago, we would have predicted that maybe overdose deaths would be up to maybe 80,000, okay? Well, I did a TEDx talk a while back, maybe nine months ago, I did a TEDx talk. And in it, I said 80,000, and I was kind of exaggerating a little bit. I was almost saying, I hope nobody checks me on this because I don't really know if it's 80,000. We anticipate it might be. Mm-hmm. Well, now we know it's more than 90,000. And we're really talking about almost certainly it's going to be more than 100,000. And this is over the course of a year. So we have a curve now that is going straight up. And wow. we need to know those statistics. Yeah. And, and there are people, the media will call us out. The politicians would call us out. And if we don't have the data, the analytics or whatever you want to call it to back it up, okay, we it, it makes it hard to get the resources. It makes it hard to get the dollars to, to work with the problem. So uh, it, it's an important thing to be able to get that type of data and, and people do those kind of studies and to have it as quickly as possible. I wish we could get a count every day now, we know right now 270 people are dying a day of overdose. Wow. It, it may be more than that. But yet, even though we know the average is 270 a day, we almost wish we could say every day exactly what it is. We almost wish, like with COVID, you know, they talked about how many hospitalizations they had, how many deaths they had. We heard that constantly, okay? And, and that was an important issue. But this issue has fallen in the background, okay? But we're losing a generation of people with their lives in front of them. Some of these people are raising kids. Uh, some, some, some of these people are, would be the people that would work for your company. Some of these people would be the people that might be inventors and leaders, okay? And we got to take this very much more seriously. And if every day they came on with statistics like they do with COVID that 270 people died and their age, average age was 32 and maybe show some pictures of these kids, all of a sudden we'd be able to push the politicians and the leaders to do more than they're doing and to study more effective ways to do it. So having those kind of stats and being able to plug it into the system can make all the world a difference. We know that. That makes me think about with COVID being at the forefront of our minds for so long, how has the opioid epidemic changed? And and I just, I'm curious, like, you know, with you being boots on the ground. What's the impact? Exactly. The the impact has really been bad. Now, most people say it's all about, this is a big issue. It's all about more stress, more anxiety, and lack of uh, community, you might say, lack of people relationship and all that is very critical and it's had a big impact but behind the scenes if you dig a little deeper there's some other strange things going on people take advantage of making money okay and the opiate uh, products basically come originally from the opioid plant opioid poppies okay Uh well the demand has been such and they charge more for the opioid poppies they figured now that they can produce this fentanyl, which is really cheap, and they can increase their profits. And so they've taken advantage of this situation right now. A person can't hardly buy regular heroin anymore. Now, not that heroin was a good thing, but heroin usually didn't kill you as quickly as fentanyl will. So 
indirectly, that has happened because of COVID. But, but I want to emphasize that's a behind the scenes aspect. The front scene is, yes, yeah, stress, anxiety, uh, not being able to get to your, your treatment center or your recovery center or have group therapy, all those, but combined with, I hate to say it, this capitalistic greed marketing type of thing. And, and, and it's really, really sad, and I got to bring this out, okay, is they even reaching now for our teenagers. And, and we're, we're talking about a teenager. My son was murdered when he was 22, and he had, without me knowing, he had progressed to a more serious drug. Mm -hmm. But you know, when he was 16, okay, he might have been smoking an occasional joint. You know, my stupid thing early on was sneaking alcohol on my daddy's uh, alcohol <laughs> supply and getting loaded. Well, what if it would have been laced with fentanyl? Exactly. I wouldn't be talking to them. Well, these kids now are getting maybe a Xanax or Percocet. And if, if it was a Xanax or Percocet, they shouldn't be taking it without a doctor's prescription or getting it from a pharmacy. But they think it's a Percocet or a Xanax. And if we could get more statistics and be able to show every day that this has happened, I think the public would rise up because there is a little more sympathy. You know, we, we try to overcome stigma, but there's a little bit more sympathy for a novice 16-year-old than for a 30-year-old that's been in and out of rehab, okay? Now, we got to have sympathy for him, too, and we got to try to move the stigma. But I have to admit, you know, if my son would have been 16 years old and I would have knocked on his door and went in his room and he was dead because he took his Xanax, hmm. uh, a, a, a lot of parents are seeing that every day. So, uh, that's so yeah, COVID has contributed to the problem. And... and on a publicity stage, uh, again, and statistical stage, we're just not talking about it as much, and it's not being advertised as much because all the energy went to COVID, uh, and, and we now that that hopefully winded down, we got to get back to the forefront on this. Okay. Yeah. I, August twenty seventh, I'm going to be speaking in front of the Chinese embassy about this issue. And, and we, we did it because it's mainly come from China. Now, not, China doesn't necessarily get the entire blame, but it's a way to bring attention to this thing. And if we could get the media involved, and if we can get statistics to back this up, the media will go along with us. And every day we ought to be publishing how many people are dying, how many of them are young kids, how many of them are middle-aged and whatnot, so that we can make a difference and we can get everybody to rise up, stop saying, what happened or watching what happened. We need people to start making things happen. A hundred percent. During the pharmacy documentary, I believe, and I can fact check this later, um, but I believe it was the DEA investigator, Iris Myers. She was saying that, you know, it was heroin season and now we're in fentanyl season. And then they also showed the graph, as you were saying, that was just complete exponential growth straight up with fentanyl. Um, illustrations like that are so important and I feel like everybody um, you know even if you're not a data visualization person or a data person at all we, we've we all been like our brains have been saturated with the COVID graphs of watching the cases go up with that exponential growth and so um, you know just being reminded that fentanyl season is happening in the background of COVID season I think is you know we need to be talking about this as you said this has been going on for decades at this point i don't know how long fentanyl season specifically has been going on um but well, fentanyl started in 2013 but okay it, it, it really didn't have a big change in, in in a growth curve okay it's really been just the last maybe three four or five years okay uh, that it's it's really been exponential okay and lots of us in our country in the media included we're kind of sleep at the wheel we're, we're, we're one of those people watching this happen or not even knowing what happened, okay? Mm -hmm. And it's my job to try to do that, which, which gets back to my organization, which I think you were going to ask me about. Absolutely. Yeah, I, 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 but the name of my organization is, it's got kind of like two names. That confuses people a little bit. My website is tunnelofhope.org. I, I named it that because I used to drive on the way to work every day when I was trying to solve my son's murder and when I was trying to put doctors out of business, I was trying to develop the pharmacy monitoring program. Uh, when I was doing all my efforts, I would drive on my way to work through a grove of trees uh, that formed like a tunnel 
in this little highway on my way to work. And I would pray in that tunnel. And I would pray, please, God, help me do this. Help me do that. I don't know what I'm doing. Uh, put the words in my mouth. Uh, give me the, what am I supposed to do? How am I supposed to do this? Well, it also envisions that there's light at the end of the tunnel. And I always want to believe there is light at the end of the tunnel. And I also want to believe maybe we can create light. So my website is Tunnel of Hope and my foundation is Tunnel of Hope. Okay. Mm-hmm. And, and But actually, when people sign in to my website, they actually join in something that I now have named the Pharmacist People's Lobby. Cool. You you see, because what I have found is, you know, there's a lot of volunteers out there working and they do, they're really doing most of the work that is trying to keep a handle on this thing. The government's involved in bureaucracy and they don't know what they're doing and they have special interests on the criminal side and the judicial side uh, and, and the, uh, the medical side, the uh, insurance company side, and the pharmaceutical industry. They are driving the politicians the way they want it to go, and it's not to the benefit of our cause on reducing this, what I call, opioid and addiction pandemic. Okay, and We need a force that can be at the table, that has clout, that has large numbers. But I want to be able to sit down before Congress or state senator when there's an issue coming up, and I want to have a seat at the table. And yeah, they're going to look at me. He lost his son. He's the pharmacist. I I, I got a little notoriety and a little bit of the platform. They'll listen to me. But if I can say I got a million followers, or I got in a state if it's 50,000 followers, and these people will send in emails to you, okay, and these people might be able to have an effect on your election, then we can get real action. And we just don't have that right now. And I'm doing everything I can do to, 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 to help that happen. So anybody out there that's listening, go to tunnelofhope.org and sign in and help me and my wife, Annie, uh, uh, make a difference like we did in the doctor series. And I, I will say this, we have a movie in the works that I'm kind of proud of. And I think it will, again, elevate the platform. And we're going to try to mix in some exposure. Okay. And uh, uh, absolutely... People have to document and keep track of things. You know, even that docu series would not have been what it would have been if I wouldn't have had tapes and and videos and backup information. Okay, mm-hmm. so to speak, data. I guess if that's what you would call it. Yeah. Uh, I never. And so, uh, it, it's an important thing for those people out there that are working on those things to be able to get accurate data as fast as possible to the advocates and the activists to help us inform the public and make a difference. Absolutely. And you mentioned a little bit earlier, you know, having more of a focus on rehabilitation instead of criminalization. Can you tell us some examples that you've seen maybe around the country or in other parts of the world of, you know, programs that are working really well to to do this? Absolutely. And and this is statistics again. Mm -hmm. My son was murdered in 1999. In 1999, Michigan, that had about 10 million people, they had about 1,000 overdose deaths. There's this little company called Portugal across the ocean. And at that time, they had a population of about 10 million also. And they had 400 uh, uh, overdose deaths. Not as much as Michigan, but still, in their little country, they took it seriously and it looked like the problem was getting worse. They had tried previously to increase the penalties, to put users in jail, to try to convince these people, like, you know, you can't do this or you're going to wind up in jail, okay? Well, they found it didn't work. So they went to their medical community, okay? And they decided they were going to change. They were going to divert all the energy and resources, or most of it, to treatment and rehabilitation, prevention, education. They were going to shift instead of having 90% of the money going to criminalization aspects and judicial aspects, okay, and jail, okay, they were going to shift it to 90% to the health care issue. Well, within years, Portugal, and even to this day, they reduced their overdose deaths by 90%. To this day, they have an average of about 50 overdose deaths a year. Meanwhile, Michigan, that was at 1,000, is now over 3,000. Our country back then, 
as a whole had 16,000 overdose deaths in 1999. 16,000. And we're now going to exceed 100,000. Mm. So we've had three, four, five hundred percent increase, and Portugal has had a 90% decrease. Now, Portugal's a different country. I don't know if that system is going to work, and we might have to have a modification of that. But we think they're going in the right direction, okay? And But it's a hard thing to change. If we can get the public on board again, if we can get the right kind of statistics, the whole public knew that Portugal lost 90, had a 90% reduction, and we had a 500% increase, and they had 50 overdose deaths a year, and we got 100,000 overdose deaths a year, okay? Just maybe some people out there would say, well, uh, let's just lock them up. Uh, you know, and that'll solve the problem. Or let's just say, uh, uh, just say no, okay? It's way more complicated than what we thought in the past, and they haven't worked. The definition of what they got, of, of idiocy or whatever it is, is continue to do the same thing over and over and expecting different results. Well, it's not only di- different results, the results are getting worse based upon what we've been doing. So I- I'm a little long-winded sometimes. So no. I think that's so important and really good point. I mean, tying it back to thinking of it as a disease, just say no. You can't just say no to COVID and you can't, you know what I mean? Like it's, yeah. You know, you just gave me a a little tool just now. That that will be, (laughs) yeah, seriously, I guess I was bouncing all around it, but you you got a concise answer there, you know? (laughs) Uh, Well, I used to say too, you know, if we now call it a disease, and some people still argue the point, but we are starting to get a consensus that it at least becomes a disease. Well, would you put a person with a disease in jail? Exactly. Great uh, point. So, yeah, that, that's another point. But but you had a simple way uh, 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 of saying it, you know, so I you like could, that. You can use that. <laughs> yeah. I, I borrow from everybody. Perfect. Good. Um, so... If you have any advice for maybe the kids or the young adults out there, what would that advice be? Well, I will give the advice. And I I do a little share of talking in schools. And I'm an advocate right now trying to get the school system, the public school systems to incorporate in ninth grade a mandatory subject, which will not only try to motivate or say things to kids, but really we'll edu- have the time to educate them on what these drugs do to your brain. Mm-hmm. And, 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 and the course would have social responsibility, personal responsibility, bullying, nonviolent conflict resolution, understanding addiction, talking about the, the evils of it, you know, but not just the evils, okay? Because, you know, I can talk about, look what happened to my son, okay? But these young kids, they don't think it could happen to them. Okay. So we, although we have to try to do that, and I'm, I may be partnering real soon with a group called uh, Victoria's Voice. Uh, th- this is a couple, they, David uh, and, uh, uh, and Jackie Seagal. And they own uh, uh, Westlake uh, 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 Resorts. He's a billionaire. They lost an 18-year-old daughter. So they're on a mission right now. And I may partner with them, and they got programs to go into the schools uh, to try to motivate these kids not to do drugs and educate. And, and I'm all for that, and I'm going to try to help them with that. But we really need, like, a class, too, that is mandatory. That isn't just this, like, either club or an occasional meeting in a gym or auditorium. Uh, so, But I would say, if anybody will listen to me, any kid, they'll get a chance to. Okay. And I was, by the way, in a gymnasium with middle schoolers just about three or four weeks ago talking about the one pill that kills. And I asked these 200 kids, I said, how many of y'all are aware of what fentanyl is? And I only had about 10 hands that went up. And then I said, how many of y'all don't have known somebody that overdosed and died or that has had serious issues? And maybe 20 or 30% of them raised their hands. Okay. Then I said, how many of y'all know about these fake tablets that are laced with fentanyl and it's killing some kids with one pill? No hands went up. Mm. So we definitely have to get that message out. I now have our school system doing public service announcement with a video of me trying to just do that. But we, it, it's a complicated issue. We got to get the parents involved. 
it, there needs to be a course. It's every bit as important as geography or history. Uh, 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 we are losing too many kids now. You know, when 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 maybe only ten percent of, of of kids were were young kids, or that when we only had sixteen thousand overdose deaths nationally, maybe you couldn't invest that effort in school because they need to do math, they need to know English, they need to know history, okay? But we're now losing 100,000, and if this graph now, this exponential graph, and there's a name for that graph when it does that, okay? But I hate to say it, if this thing now does, if that graph continues that rate in another year, it'll be 200,000 or 300,000. Mm -hmm. This is a generation of young people the ramification is or immense. And then, you know, if one person dies, there's a hundred people that were involved in that. So mm -hmm. when you get a hundred thousand people that overdose and die, multiply that times a hundred as to how many people were affected. Right. Uh, you know, and it, it, it's so tragic. That particular couple that I talked about, he resigned from his own company right after that. And now they have dedicated their lives to try to do whatever they can do. And they have resources now that I don't have. But I may wind up being part of them, I and I'm going to help them any way I can. And I think they're going to help me any way uh, uh, they, they can help me. But we need we need a Dunkirk thing. We need a million little boats, okay? And, and, and that's what I'm about. Yeah. No, definitely. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm so glad that we were able to amplify your story to get more little boats backing you up for sure, because you've done so much and um, you definitely deserve the support for such an important mission. Um, I want to be respectful of your time. We're, we're just about out of time. Is there anything else that you'd like to share before we hop off? I guess the only thing else I would say is uh, I talk about the Dunkirk story, but I also sometimes talk about the Walter Cronkite effect. Walter Cronkite started talking during the Vietnam War uh, when it was going along. He started talking about how many people were dying every day. And he started taking a short picture of these people dying. First thing you know, some of the college campuses start having protests. Eventually, eventually through the media, and back then he was kind of controlling a lot of the media, okay? Uh, and But eventually it got through, and a politician had a better chance of getting elected if he was against the war Previous to him speaking out on this thing, a person couldn't get elected if he spoke out against the war. Mm. We need to have the same kind of Walter Cronkite effect in this. We need the media and make people aware of the magnitude of the problem. And if we do that with other leaders like me that go around and, and, and other advocates that are working really hard about this, we have to do something to change the direction. It's not going to end overnight. It's never going to go to zero, but we've got to stop that curve. It's scary. Yeah. It's always been bad, but this is this is a nightmare scenario. And people got to realize the urgency. they got to step up. Absolutely. Yeah, thank you so much for sharing your story, Dan, for being so open and... Um... Yeah, just telling your story. Uh, I think it, you know, it's so important, and um, I'm really excited that we can get it out there. I, I don't know if you'll get this in too, though, but uh, yeah. Jenna and Julia first, and the people at Cinema that helped me produce the, the the documentary, they did an incredible job. Along the way, I wasn't so sure about that. I wasn't even sure about the name. Let me tell you, they do more than I do in that particular case. They did an incredible job, and it's given me a platform now, and I think it's going to lead to a movie, but it's going to lead to maybe, maybe making a debt, and move, what I call moving the needle, but moving it down. And uh, they got another producer there named Mike Sparrow. He's a great guy, too. Uh, they, they did a great job with this story. Most people that watch it, okay, when they get to one end of one, there's like a hook, and they yes. can't stop watching it. Many of them binge watch this thing. Oh, so. I I binged it when it first came out last year, and I also binged it again when I found out that I got to talk to you and Julia and Jenner, and it was, yeah, same effect. I watched it twice and both times binged it. It was wonderful storytelling, um, and you are a, a perfect key subject for it. So, um, and, and really quick, too, about the movie. Can you share any details? So uh, the movie right now, the producer is a guy named uh, David Permute. He did a movie called Hacksaw Ridge. Oh, wow. it, it, it did real, real well. And I, it's my understanding they're working with directors now and screenwriters 
and they even went out to a potential actor, and it was Brad Pitt. Wow. And so we don't, you know, we, nobody has signed up yet, so that may not happen. But uh, I, I, I really hope that it's viewed by hundreds of people, and not just for the notoriety. And I, I've ne- I really made almost nothing in this thing. I've spent way more of my life and my time, okay? But it, it spread a message. I have found out that the media, I would not be speaking to you right now if I would not have had that show. And a lot of people now know a little bit more about the addiction issue and, and are, are tuned in a little bit more. Well, if we can build upon this and have a movie, and then we might have interviews where Julia and Jenna on a on a Today Show talking about the makings of this thing, okay? And maybe I'm sitting there with Brad Pitt and we're talking about the things I had to overcome and the risks I had to take. And... But we also going to be delivering a message out there that my family and me was just one family. A million others lost a kid like that. When, when you see my wife crying in that, in that video, or, and, and when you hear her in the background, the audio tape to capture her saying, God, why did you take my baby? Okay. Well, guess what? If you could record what takes place in every house that loses a kid, you would hear a very similar message. Mm. But most people didn't record it, particularly 20 years ago. Yeah. And God had something to do with me saving them tapes, okay? Those tapes easily could have been destroyed in Hurricane Katrina. Right. But they weren't, okay? And it, there's a reason for that. And that really helped our documentary, and it's going to help the movie, and it's, I think it's going to save lives. And so... Kind of a stumble bump. I didn't know what I was doing. <laughs> okay, I didn't really know I was a data collector or analytical guy. Or whatever yeah. that was. But, but I know that's important now. Absolutely, yeah. And it it also just you know your vulnerability and sharing that with with the world. I think is so special and. I definitely, uh, you know, I think it is definitely going to make a difference. It already has. So, um, yeah, I really appreciate you being so open. Well, thank you, Maddie. You, you've done a good job yourself. And uh, let, let's hope uh, this message gets out and, and saves some lives. And, uh, and I hope it actually helps me build that registry that I want, that people's lobby. That isn't about profit. This is not a lobby that's for profit. This is a lobby to have influence to save lives. Great. Well, yeah, we'll be sure to link to all of these resources in the show notes as well um, for our audience to easily find them. I'll give you one other thing. I don't know if you want to add it into the links or not. Absolutely. But, uh, but, but my social media is I have a, 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 what they call a supporters group. And it's mm. a Facebook group. And it's supporters of the pharmacist, Dan mm-hmm. Schneider. Great. And, uh, and that's another way that people can go on and it's interactive and people can share their stories. And, and a lot of those people also join my lobby, uh, but they can find out about what's going on. Now, when they in my lobby, I also send them information from time to time and I will ask them to respond to certain political situations and be aware of what's going on. So, uh, yeah. That's great. And, and there's many other ways of doing it, but I'm learning. I started with Facebook because, uh, I'm an old guy, an old fart, okay? All right. It, it, it you know. works. Facebook works. Well, I got a lady that's working on my TikTok following, and I got another lady working oh. on an Instagram following. So, you know, I, I don't know too much about these things, but I'm going to get others to help me out because it takes all age groups. By the way, without mentioning, I also not mention I got a relationship with Miss America 2020. A girl, oh. named, a girl named Camille Schreier was a pharmacy student she became Miss America the same year my docu series came out, and we've went around the country speaking together. Awesome! She, she's doing an HSO t- tour now with the uh, with the Army, I believe it is, or the Air Force, okay, around the country. But she's a dynamo, and part of her platform was the same as mine. It was kind of a God thing that we connected at the same time. That's so, so cool. They call us the Beauty and the Beast. <laughs> I'll leave it up to you to name who was the beauty and who was the beast. <laughs> that sounds like an awesome partnership. Yeah. And yeah. What a coincidence that she was a pharmacy student and everything. That's so well, cool. On top, on top of this, she gets to be Miss America for two years because they didn't have a Miss America pageant. Oh, interesting. So she's, she's Miss America 2020 and 2021. So the extra, yeah, that extra exposure. How perfect is that? 
and That's actually, great. she's only kind of working part time They wanted her to fulfill the full role. She wants to get back in pharmacy school and finish her education. Okay. That's cool. And she already has a biochemistry degree. Okay. Yeah. And guess what her talent was when she won Miss America. And after you can look this up yourself on YouTube. Okay. Guess her talent was she performed a chemical experiment on stage. Oh, wow. I love that. I mean, all of these things, you know, I think there's too many things going on for it to be coincidental. I feel like you're meant to like kind of have this platform and these connections. The universe just really, you know, is, is supporting this mission. It's very important. It, 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 it's all about my song. And, and it was the same thing with the uh, the, the billionaire who, who, who's involved in trying to do this. OK, it, it, it's all about making some sense of this, trying to prevent other families from having these kind of tragedies trying to save some lives. And uh, I guess, you know, make sure that our kids didn't die in vain or any of these kids that have died in, in vain. You know, uh, it's, it, it's just such an important thing to us, to me Absolutely. and my wife, to, 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 to try to do whatever we can do to turn that graph into a reverse exponential. Thank you so much. I really appreciate it. Um, and it if you do, Julia and, and uh, Jenna, tell them I said hi. Absolutely. I definitely will. <laughs> Thanks for listening. Dan just mentioned Julia and Jenner, and he's referring to the directors of the pharmacist documentary on Netflix that he worked so closely with to get this story out there. As I mentioned earlier, I interviewed Julia and Jenner, and you'll hear that conversation in our next episode, where I'll chat with them about the use of data in filmmaking. Be sure to check out Dan's foundation at tunnelofhope.org. And for links to any of the other resources mentioned in this episode, check out our show notes at community.altrix.com slash podcast. Catch you next time.